Good evening, church. What a blessing it was to see everyone on Sunday. It absolutely thrilled my heart to hear God's people singing together once again. In a couple of weeks, on June 14th, we're going to have our teachers' meeting, and we're going to come up with a plan for reopening Sunday school again. This will give us a couple of weeks to see how regathering is going and see if we need to make any adjustments along the way. We're also going to be having a graduation celebration on that same day. We're going to celebrate those uh, who are graduating from kindergarten, eighth grade, or as a senior in high school. If you have someone in your home that is graduating this year, uh, please be sure to give me a call or text me and let me know uh, that, that you have someone. It's exciting to see our kids go to the next level of maturity as they grow in the Lord. I hope that you'll all be able to be there to celebrate with us and encourage them in their growth for the Lord. Well, today we're going to look at Psalm 24. F.B. Meyer said that Psalm 22 tells us of the cross, Psalm 23 tells us of the crook, or the shepherd's crook, and Psalms 24 tells of the crown. Another way to put it is the Savior, the Shepherd, and the Sovereign. This is a great psalm. Psalm 24 says this. First of all, it's a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the house of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? <clears throat> he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. The psalm was written to celebrate the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant back to the house, from the house of Obed-Edom. The Ark, which was a symbol of God's presence, had not been in the tabernacle for a while now. It was stolen from by the Philistines and kept in their pagan temple until the plagues from God became too much for them to handle. So, the Philistines sent it back to the Israelites on an ox cart. This really was a miraculous thing in and of itself, but I don't have time to get into that right now. But as it came to Israel, the Israelites rejoiced, but they became careless with the ark. They all knew that it needed to be respected and not touched, but when someone reached out to steady the ark, God struck them dead. David found a home nearby, the home of Obed-Edom, and asked that the ark be stored there. Obed-Edom agreed, and God richly, miraculously blessed his house while the ark was there. Now David knew it was time to bring the ark home. So this is the setting for this psalm. I see four principles that David establishes in this psalm. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, he establishes ownership. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. See, the earth is God's. He owns the title deed. He is the only one worthy of owning the world. <laughs> and he owns everything in the world because he created it. This includes every person who has ever lived. What you have, even your very life, is the Lord's. He's not a tyrant with what he owns, but he does own it. Your house is the Lord's, your money is the Lord's, your savings is the Lord's, your family is the Lord's. Are you yielding everything you have to the Lord? 
both by living righteously with your possessions and by giving what He wants you to give to further His kingdom. He owns it. The second principle is He establishes it uh, that he establishes his responsibility. Verses 3 and 4, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, who has the right to stand before the Lord? He answers this in verse 4, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. When he speaks of clean hands, he's speaking of our conduct. Is your conduct becoming of righteousness? He says, our soul is not lifted unto vanity. This is speaking of idolatry. You might say, well, Pastor Wallace, I'm safe there. I don't have any idols of stone or wood in my house. But do you have idols of possessions? Idols of entertainment? Idols of prosperity? Even idols of family? You see, anything that you put in priority before God becomes an idol in your life. Then he speaks of not lifting your soul into vanity or swearing deceitfully. This is speaking of your integrity. Are you living your life with integrity? Is your word your bond? When you promise something, do you fulfill it? These are the ones who can come before the Lord. Thirdly, David establishes reward. In verse 5 he says, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Those who live right, who worship the Lord with their whole life, and who live with integrity, these receive the blessings from the Lord. Now, none of us are perfect. That's why we need a Savior in the first place. Part of the salvation experience is the fact that we've received the righteousness of Christ. God knows we're not perfect. But when we trust in Christ as our Savior, He sees us in the righteousness of Christ. And so... If we keep our hearts toward the Lord, we too will receive this blessing He has promised us. In verse 7 through 10, David establishes the fourth principle, the principle of worship. He says twice a command and then a question and an answer. The command is to open wide the gates and the doors that the king may come in. The question is asked, who is the king of glory? And then the answer comes, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, the Lord of hosts. The principle here is the principle of worship. To the Israelites at this time, the call was to open the city gates to let the presence of God in. To the Christian, the call rings out to open the gates of our hearts open wide that Christ may rule and reign with His presence in our life. He is strong and mighty enough to meet your every need. He wants to be the king of your heart. We just need to vacate our heart's throne to allow him to enter. Who is the king of your life? I hear a resounding answer, Jesus, of course. But is he? If we were to take account of this last week and all the choices that you made, could we really say that it was Jesus on that throne? I hope so. It's a daily battle to keep our selfish, grubby little paws off that throne. Give God His rightful place in your life. Make every choice you make based on what would Jesus do in this situation. Pray throughout the day, Lord, what would you have me to do here? There would not be enough pages on earth, nor ink to, enough to write the blessings that you would see from God when we truly yield our entire lives to God. I pray that you have a wonderful rest of your week. May the Lord richly bless you and your family today.